Nintendo's marketing has an aesthetic entirely unlike those more common among other major video game publishers and developers. Their Nintendo Directs, Treehouses, and other broadcasts have a sort of friendly and familiar tone. And their games take a similar approach. Games like Pokemon, Animal Crossing, Breath of the Wild, and others use cheery, vibrant color palettes and cute character designs to create a sense of caring and friendliness and approachability that's incredibly welcome in a landscape of games that are often much bleaker and more desaturated than what Nintendo has to offer. It is Nintendo's entire identity. Cheerful. Family-friendly. Approachable. And because of this, it's easy to excuse failures on the part of the developers making Nintendo's games by assuming they care a great deal about the people who play them. After all, they've said time and time again that their goal is to create the best experience possible for fans, and have done everything in their power to cultivate an inviting and welcoming atmosphere. But that isn't necessarily true, and in recent weeks, given the reactions to some announcements made about upcoming Pokemon titles and the reactions to those reactions, it seems necessary to clarify that Game Freak and Nintendo are not your friends. They do not care about you. They don't care about your interests, or your problems, or your goals, or your desires, they're businesses. And as businesses, their primary interest is, has been, and always will be how much money they can make from you, the consumer. Creating games that are enjoyed by millions is just a means to this end. I know it can be hard to believe that the company that spent the last 23 years selling two copies of the same game with only minor differences over and over again would do something greedy and irresponsible, but if you can see through PR speak by, uh, I don't know, Todd Howard? We have had an incredibly exciting year at Bethesda Game Studios. Given some of that excitement, impressed you're still here. It should be no more difficult to see through Junichi Masada. On June 11th, during a gameplay presentation in a Nintendo Treehouse event, longtime Pokemon developer Junichi Masada announced that Pokemon Sword and Shield would not enable players to transfer Pokemon from other games unless they appeared within the game's regional Pokedex. This was a, uh, controversial statement, for a number of reasons. Competitive players, longtime fans who had become attached to Pokemon they had caught in earlier titles, and those who have interest in completing the National Pokedex all had distinct reasons to take issue with it. But just as there was backlash to the decision, there was backlash to the backlash. Many who felt unaffected by cutting Pokemon defended Game Freak, dismissing complaints about the decision and calling those who were affected and complained childish, or entitled, or ungrateful, or stubborn, or painting them as loud, angry man-children shouting down everyone else. And while it's understandable to not be bothered by these cuts, after all, significant portions of players won't continue to play the games much past completion of the main single-player content, and many of those who do won't seek to collect all Pokémon or choose to train Pokémon that aren't available natively within the game, none of these responses to the criticisms laid at Game Freak are very fair. Game Freak is not exempt from the standards other studios are held to simply because you like Pokemon. Again, Game Freak is not your friend. Criticisms toward it are not personal attacks, and Pokemon is not a gift that Game Freak chooses to give away every few years. It's a product, made by Game Freak with the intention of selling to consumers. Players owe no gratitude to Game Freak for the opportunity to play Pokemon games as they're not given freely. They're purchased, and therefore wholly earned by those who do so. Furthermore, it's not in any way entitled to expect better from a company or from a product than what you're given, especially if it suffers a noticeable downgrade from or failure to improve upon an earlier product. Pokemon Sword and Shield cost 150% of what the previous main series titles cost, and yet, from what's been shown so far, they offer very few meaningful improvements upon them. It's not unreasonable for a player to expect that after more than 20 years on underpowered handheld consoles, Pokémon's first foray into a main series console release should be larger in scope than its predecessors. Instead, Sword and Shield are significantly more limited in scope than the 7th generation of games which managed to fit more than 800 unique Pokémon onto the 3DS, a system that was many times weaker than the Nintendo Switch. 
Given these facts, comments like these are unhelpful at best in conversations about the issue, as they're dismissive of and condescending toward those with real and valid complaints about the direction Game Freak has chosen to take Pokémon. While you personally may not care about or be affected by the change, it's not wrong of those who are to voice their concerns publicly, or to elect not to purchase the games, or to encourage others who feel similarly to do the same. Nobody's obligated to purchase these games just because they have Pokémon in them. Spending $60 on a video game isn't some default behavior that requires massive justification for deviating from. Anyone can, at any time and for any reason, choose not to purchase any game, even ones they were previously interested in. All of this happens to miss another issue with the announcement. Pokémon Home, an expansion upon the functionality of the previously existing Pokémon Bank system, does not allow Pokémon transferred to home from bank to be transferred back. This means that any Pokémon that are transferred to home but do not appear in the Galar Pokédex will be trapped in a virtual limbo until such a time as a new game is released that they can be transferred to. This poses several issues, chief among which is the threat of losing them entirely. If home functions similarly to bank, there's a chance that Pokémon stored in home when a subscription expires will disappear and it's frankly impossible to justify charging a recurring fee to host Pokémon that players aren't allowed to use on a server that they cannot remove them from and have to continue to pay for or risk losing them forever. Some who have defended the decision have pointed towards Masada's initial announcement. Masada claimed the choice was not an easy one and offered a number of reasons for it, citing balance, overall animation quality, a desire to offer a unique experience, and most crucially, a desire to release the game within a strict time frame, ostensibly so that fans wouldn't have to wait. In further discussions, Masada has continually restated that this was a difficult decision and that those at Game Freak care deeply about the future of Pokémon. And in all of this, it's been presented as if this was the only option, however unfortunate. And while it would be nice to believe that Game Freak were torn up about this, that they had exhausted every option and in the end, chosen what they honestly felt was best for the franchise? They... didn't. Balance concerns are easily refuted. The games already feature a built-in mechanism preventing the usage of high-level Pokémon transferred to a new game in the form of disobedient Pokémon, and the developers are under no obligation to allow all Pokémon to be transferred early within the game, or to allow all Pokémon to be used in a competitive context, and neither of these are original ideas. In Black and White, for example, while it was possible to transfer all Pokémon from Generation 4 titles, the player could only do this after completing the main single-player content. And in official competitive events during 2017, Pokémon not available in the Alolan Pokédex were simply banned from competitive play, an option that could easily be implemented in Sword and Shield. Game Freak's balance choices weren't limited to simply including or excluding every Pokémon, and they weren't unaware of the other options available, having already explored several in the past. Claims about a desire for better overall animation quality are similarly dubious. In gameplay demonstrations thus far, a number of visual and technical issues have been clearly visible, with low-resolution textures and low-poly models and extremely obvious pop-in, and some animations are largely static. I mean, just look at Wingull over here, T-posing around the map like he's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Several of the other animations that have been shown off so far appear to be recycled or very slightly modified from previous titles, and battle animations suffer similar flaws. And it would be wrong to pretend that these animations are somehow insignificant. After all, the bulk of the playtime within these games will be spent either running around the map or in battle and there's little reason to believe that if the animations for the two largest portions of the game are so neglected that other areas will see significantly better treatment. And frankly, if they do, that simply demonstrates a severe disconnect in the developer's priorities. The most reasonable argument made is a desire to create a unique and meaningful experience by having only specific Pokémon playable within a given game. And while this may have some merit, it's hard to justify excluding all transfers of Pokémon from other regions, even post-game, simply to create a single-player experience more easily distinguishable from other titles. It's hard, really, to even say that it would do much to provide a more unique experience, as for many players, transferring Pokémon from other titles would follow the completion of the main single-player content anyway. And Game Freak's past attempts to facilitate uniqueness within each generation haven't exactly been met with high praise. 
While controversial among some at first, Mega Evolutions were quickly embraced by fans as an enjoyable new feature in Generation 6, only to be dropped entirely from Generation 7 in favor of Z-Moves. Z-Moves were also generally well received, though many took issue with the failure of Sun and Moon to build upon the Mega Evolution concept introduced in the previous generation. In turn, Z-Moves have been dropped from Generation 8 in favor of... Dynamax. Dynamax is the main new battle mechanic advertised for Sword and Shield, and while it may be unfair to judge it just yet, given that there are possibly other properties that have yet to be unveiled, simply making your Pokémon bigger and stronger is far from an interesting mechanic, and it's hardly a welcome replacement for Z-Moves and Mega Evolutions, which, if the trend continues, will go the way of other discarded and under-supported innovations upon the Pokémon formula, like triple and rotation battles, or Pokémon contests, or alternating seasons, or follower Pokémon. It's difficult, really, to argue that Game Freak has ever done a good job of providing any sort of unique experience compared to other Pokémon titles. In the time since Pokémon's first release, only a few new Pokémon types have been added, and the battle system and mechanics have largely remained the same. Little new content, aside from new Pokémon and regions, has been added, and to date, there are many issues within the games that have completely failed to be addressed in any way, like the arbitrary restriction on nicknaming traded Pokémon, or the archaic and needlessly complicated system of IV breeding that acts as a major time sink, and a gate preventing new players from being able to seriously compete against others. And there's still very little that can be done with Pokémon outside of battle, with the biggest option so far, Pokémon Ami, being little more than a stripped-down Nintendogs minigame. But by far the most concerning justification given for the removal of many Pokémon was the desire to release the game earlier. Masada claims in the initial announcement that this is... So we don't keep fans waiting too long for every new entry in the series. Which is, you know, probably the most diplomatic way possible of saying the game is being rushed to make a deadline, so... Points for that, I guess? Shigeru Miyamoto once said, in a quote that has today become as trite and overplayed as any other hashtag deep quote swimming around in the vast ocean of useless information that is the internet, a delayed game is eventually good. A rushed game is forever bad. In 2019, it's difficult to continue to believe in this philosophy. Games are released all the time nowadays with major bugs or issues on launch that are patched and adjusted as time goes on and new content is added regularly through updates and expansions. Even some of Nintendo's properties, like Super Smash Bros. and Breath of the Wild, have branched out into additional downloadable content. Game Freak is, of course, an exception to this rule, with a record of failure to support games through updates after release. Instead, even in today's landscape of updatable games and downloadable content, Game Freak has continued to release all meaningful updates as entirely separate games, which is part of why it's so frustrating to see a Pokémon game be so brazenly pushed out the door, given there's very little likelihood of the issue ever being addressed. At least, not for less than $60. And the most unfortunate reality is that all of this was completely avoidable. Many of the issues Game Freak faced in the development of Sword and Shield could have been mitigated quite easily by an expansion in scope. Game Freak is a fairly small developer compared to most AAA studios. As of April 2018, they reported only 143 employees, including contract employees. And during the development of Sword and Shield, their resources have been split between it and another game called Town. Game Freak's relatively small size has been used by some to defend their decisions, and that would be understandable, perhaps, if Pokémon was a smaller property. But... it isn't. It's Pokémon. It is the single most profitable media property in history. Since its first appearance in February of 1996, Pokémon's collective media empire has grossed over 90 billion American dollars worldwide. That's more than Harry Potter, more than DC, more than Marvel, it's more than Star Wars for God's sake. It's an absolutely ludicrous amount of money. And Game Freak being the studio responsible for the games that lie at the absolute heart of the biggest multimedia franchise in human history could very easily afford to expand in scope. It's not as if they don't have the resources. It's extremely hard not to look at all of this and come to the conclusion that Sword and Shield are being rushed. 
that they're unfinished and incomplete games. Because they are. Game Freak's tacit admission of their desire to release this game earlier as opposed to extending the development period in order to create a better experience is a chilling indication of what lies in store for the Pokémon franchise. It's not the scale of the task that has prevented Sword and Shield from having full access to all Pokémon. It's the timeline. Other major properties like EA Sports titles or Call of Duty or Assassin's Creed have followed similar trajectories a downward slope in quality, and a consistent failure to produce meaningful improvements with each passing game. Pushing to release games more frequently inevitably comes at the cost of quality, and Pokémon is no exception to this rule. Increasing the cost of games while simultaneously decreasing their quality and pushing for more frequent releases is a stunning act of anti-consumer behavior. This decision doesn't benefit the games. It doesn't benefit the players, it doesn't benefit those who care deeply about the franchise, who have grown up with it, who have looked forward to the first home console release, who were excited about getting the chance to experience a fully realized, high-definition game with their favorite monsters. It doesn't benefit the consumer. It benefits only those who stand to profit off of the decision to cut corners and cut costs. And they've already made it clear that this will be their policy moving forward for all new Pokémon games. Perhaps none of this would have needed saying if not for Game Freak's response to the backlash on June 28th, which sparked the discussion all over again. In it, Masada offered a lukewarm response that failed to acknowledge any of the issues raised and stated that while Pokémon might not be playable in Sword and Shield, that didn't mean they would be gone forever, which is maybe the worst response they could have given. Like. Yeah, you'll never get to play with all your Pokémon in the same game ever again, but maybe, eventually, down the line, you can pay us more money for the chance to play with some of them, like some sort of twisted lottery. Honestly, missing the point this badly is probably the most impressive thing we've seen from Sword and Shield's marketing so far. But Game Freak knows that's not the real issue. They just don't care. As long as all this backlash doesn't significantly affect their bottom line, and there's a chance it won't because any losses in sales from those put off by this decision could easily be offset by the reduction in costs it enables, they don't have any reason to care. Instead, they can just sit around playing Pokemon Snap and ignore everyone who has a problem with it. Because they're not your friends. Unless your favorite Pokemon is from Kanto then you're probably fine.